Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. I'm excited here to drop in with Eric Kaufman and talk about integration, specifically integrating spirituality and mindfulness into the workplace and really Eric's journey. So Eric, welcome to the Soul Seeker podcast. My first question to kick off this conversation is if you were just meeting someone in passing and you just had a couple minutes to introduce yourself, how would you explain what you're all about and what you stand for? They were going to start with an easy question. Um, <laughs> no solid ones all, here. What am I all about in an easy way? <clears throat> I am all about... Um, so my mission for my business is to mint 10,000 conscious leaders. Right? That's really what, what the work is about. It's, uh, how, do we, how do we mint 10,000 conscious leaders? And so you might ask, uh, what is minting? Well, I'm just going to let you actually was that my question. <laughs> <laughs> Some people will say, what is conscious leaders? And the first person is people say, what the hell is minting? Yeah. Uh, you know, when you mint a coin, you take, um, you take a, a precious metal, usually gold or silver, right? That's what in the old days, at least. And you would put it through a process to give it a shape that then has value in the larger community, right? So the, the chunk of gold on its own has value, but it's not really tradable. When you take it and put it through the minting process and out comes a coin, you can trade that coin, right? It has, it has a, a collective value. And that's what the idea of minting is, right? Can we take the sort of the potential, the reality, what exists in there already as the soul, the spirit, the heart, the guts, the courage, the beauty, the genius, all that is within a human being moving through a process, you know, a little bit of pressure, a little bit of pressing, a little bit of forming. So that on the other side, there is something of even greater value that trades well in the community, right? That, that affects each other in a, in a positive way. So that's minting. Conscious leaders are essentially leaders that are, to your point, integrated, right? It's not just pe- people who put up solar panels on their roof and recycle. That's wonderful and beautiful, but that doesn't require an elevated state of consciousness. A conscious leader is somebody who's actually correcting and, and healing some of what I call ego myopia. So my mission is to mint 10,000 conscious leaders, particularly executives of organizations, because my theory of change is that our world is not being shaped so much anymore by governments and by religious organizations. They still have an influence, but there's an outsized influence from the commercial forces, right? The business sector. And if we can get the business leaders to wake up and to wear this mantle of responsibility from a place of consciousness, not from a place of duty or pain, then we have a much better chance to have this kind of distributed positive effect. So that's my story. That's perfect. Thank you so much for that. So for a little bit of context, like how long have you been in the conscious leadership space and helping leaders to be minted and integrate this into the workplace? I started doing this in 2000, so we'll do now. This is an evergreen podcast, so whenever, whenever this person hears it, it's just 2000, but uh, at this point, you know, going on a quarter century of doing this work. And how'd you get into it? I got into it as, a, as an integration process of my own. I, uh, um, I was, uh, you know, 
I went to college, graduated, went to work at 3M, then went to work at Coronator, big corporate entities, was doing really well as a young manager, executive. I was also really into meditation and in the Zen tradition. I started when I was 19. Uh, by the time I was in my early 30s, I sort of realized I've got these two discrete experiences of life. I wake up, meditate, I do all these things during the week and the weekend with the meditation community, uh, all these spiritual practices and readings and, you know, group meditations. And then during the day, I was this commercial, you know, machine turning value and profit for shareholders and, um, which was fine for a while until it became, you know, my, the general manager in our facility was promoting me to become general manager. The teacher in our community was promoting me to be a teacher in the community. And I suddenly started going, whoa, I have one foot in this world, one foot in this world. And I, you know, I just, you know, my, uh, my, my, I was just getting stretched. It was starting to hurt. And so I realized I can actually bring the two together. Um, and I, I, I did that first by dropping off the grid. We can talk about that if it makes sense, but, um, how it came about it was from my own experience, right? I was working diligently in corporate. I was working diligently in the spiritual realm and I wanted the two to come together. And so finding how to do that was a big risk, but, um, it's turned out to be a great reward. So at that point, when you went off the grid, uh, it was, it seemed like it was a little bit of like a renunciation. Didn't you sell everything you had? Could you give us a <laughs> little bit of an overview of what that looked like for people that are just meeting you for the first time? Sure. I, um, I really wanted to, let's see, let me think about this. So I wasn't sure entirely what to do, but I knew that I didn't want to keep doing what I was doing. And so I realized that I needed a pretty hardcore reset. Um, and I, I guess like a, you know, a weekend ceremony with I, I wasn't going to cut it for me at the time. So it became a little more radical. I decided to completely, completely drop off. And so I did, I sold everything I had liquid in my 401k, gave away all my money, shaved my head, you know, uh, give, you know, burn childhood photos and, and, and school, wow. you know, uh, documents. I mean, I was like, I was burning the past, right? I was being, I was gone. And real and, quick about how old were you? And like, you were in the thick of corporate at the time. I was 30, 30, well, 32, 31. Yeah. Uh, and yes, I was, uh, uh, when I went to my, uh, general manager and said, you know, I'm quitting. He looked at me and it's like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I was like, well, what do you mean? I said, he said, Chris, said, what do they offer you? I'll double it. And I was like, no, I'm not going to a competitor. I'm not, I'm not going anywhere else, but I'm flattered by the offer. And that was kind of a, a moment of pause, right? Like, wait a second, I could drop off the grid or I could double my income right now. Um, feels like it was the first test for the guardians at the threshold. And so, um, yeah, I decided very, I just needed to sort of completely cut off. And your question was, how old was I? And what was your question was? Yeah. You said you were like 31, 32 at the time. Yeah. 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 And then really? when you dropped off the grid, you burned all these pictures, you sold every, like burning of the childhood pictures. And these, when you say documents, obviously like not your birth, not my birth certificate, you know, but like, and like school reports and, you know, and, and, and like high schools, you know, uh, you know, awards and stuff like that, you know, so True. no, not birth certificate, not my, not my passport. <laughs> yeah. That, that would be like a, a little nutso. Right. But, um, everything else that you did, wow, that's incredible. And how can you walk us through kind of like what that looked like once you did that, how long it lasted and how you integrate that into your life moving forward? So I ended up, um, there was a property in New Mexico that was owned by the spiritual community that I was part of. And so I, um, went up there and spent three solid months cutting down trees, clearing, clearing a, a, a patch in the, in the forest in the mountains of New Mexico and building a 625 square foot cabin. Um, that was, uh, I had a, a bedroom, a meditation slash yoga room a bathroom, a kitchen. Um, and then I moved into the cabin and I ended up living there for a year. So it was a year alone in the cabin. Actually, I didn't, 
socializer, talk to people. <clears throat> My friends from the community nearby would bring food. So I didn't have to leave the, the property. I didn't have to go down, you know, an hour and a half into town. Um, and, uh, and I just lived up there and I meditated and, uh, prayed and went deep into spiritual practice for what ended up being uh, a year. And I would have stayed there longer other than I had this light directing download about a year into journey that basically said, uh, you're going the wrong way. Uh, that living cross-legged on the mountaintop all by yourself is not the life of awakening for you and that your life will be, your spiritual awakening is with wife, children, service, and community. And I remember sitting there going, oh, bullshit. <laughs> Give me another message. <laughs> I was like, I really don't want to get married. I really don't want to have kids. I, you know, I, I, I'm loving this intense solitude. Um, and I sat with that for another month or so and nothing ever came. And I realized, well, if in my clearest moment of existence, this download comes forward, I should probably pay attention and mm -hmm. lean in. And so, um, that's in fact what happened. I, I left the cabin, uh, handed the keys over to the community up there, drove down to San Diego and, uh, figured out what, what does a life look like? If somebody who wants to pursue and continue to be a soul seeker, right? This is my life. Um, but also a householder, which is what, what my direction was, right? This is what I was just in, 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 instructed or guided to do. Um, and, uh, Took about a year and a half to find some woman just crazy enough to say yes. Because <laughs> at this point, you know, early 30s with no career, no money, uh, a gnarly beard, and very little potential as far as anyone could tell from the outside. Um, so for her to say yes, we, we joked for years who took the bigger risk. But she'd take the risk of marrying me, kind of a not so not at all part of her family of origin experience, or me marrying a traditional woman. <laughs> you know? mm. And so uh, that argument's stupid, but it was fun for a while. Uh, I'll pause there anyway. Yeah. That's the embodiment of soul life balance right there. And that's, uh, I love that. That's, that's amazing. So what I'm really hearing from you is like this career transition. And what I notice with most people that are going through the awakening process or unfolding is that it is a process and it's unfolding, right? And with that, the number one theme that I've seen, and this is just in my past five years, so I'd be curious to hear from you what you've seen in the past 20 plus years, is a career transition. And not only that, like what this theme is, but zoning in, narrowing in on the career transition, like that is such a hard space for most people and where a lot of us get tripped up. Do you have any specific advice that you could share with navigating career transitions? Uh, you know, the career transition is a, is a, it is thematically consistent among people who oh, begin the awakening journey. So to your point, there's something to it. And so I think before we start asking advice, it's probably worthwhile dropping a step back and going, well, how come? No, okay. you know, yeah. you know, <laughs> why do you sort of, you know, you start meditating intensely or you take, you know, plant medicine or whatever. Next thing you go, oh, wait a minute, I want a career transition. Like. What the hell's the connection? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't pretend to know every connection for every person, but I can tell you something that is consistent among most people, right? It's the process of awakening, as we described, as you sort of mentioned, right? In large measure is the process of detangling, right? Mm -hmm. You talk about integration. Integration is on the other side, right? But on this side, we are already integrated in so much as that we are in, interlaced and woven into the prevailing construct of whatever normal was for us and whatever that normal was typically is our family of origins, notions of what life is. And so when we go and get our career, we think we're being like, you know, independent and autonomous, but we're getting a career based on assumptions in our consciousness of what is the appropriate way for us to be in the world. And our professional choice is one expression of that sense of who we are, what we stand for, what our values are what our family of origin, what our religion, what I call mother, father, church, and state, right? This is where we learned who to be. And so from that mother, father, church, and state, we've conceived 
this is what I'm going to do professionally. Then we start awakening, right? And we start detangling. And some of the fundamental assumptions about who we are start coming loose, right? Oh, wait, do I really need to be kind to everyone all the time? Or is it okay for me to set up a big boundary? Is it really true that foreigners are all dangerous? Or is it possible that all humans are connected? You know, so the fundamental assumptions about who we are start detangling. And pretty soon we wake up to our career and we go, well, wait a second. Why the hell am I doing this? This doesn't represent who I am anymore, which is a true, that's what a lot of people say, right? It's just not me. So who is that me that it's not anymore? It's not the me that's unfolding, unwinding, detangling from the prior version that was pre-verbal, pre-conscious. And so, you know, so let me pause there. I mean, does that, does that sort of track me for you? Oh, absolutely. There is one thing that I want to unpack, and it was what you said about kindness. Could you expand on that a little bit? Because I think this is a really important point. Um, kindness is like one of the high bar markers of spiritual awakening, right? But kindness can look different ways at different times. So I remember when my daughters were young and they were playing with their cousins and their mom at the time, you know, this rock and superstar salesperson in a big pharmaceutical, right? They were, the girls were struggling with something and she looked over and she said, be nice to each other. Don't fight. As she then got on the phone to like rip the competition apart or kill them and crush the market, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember that scene so well because like she literally said, be kind, be nice. And then she got on the phone. She's like, God damn it, you got to get this thing done. You know, that's like this is a real vicious salesperson that was so successful and so glorious in her, in her power. I loved it. But there's a certain level of kindness that isn't really kindness. It's just, you know, muting ourselves in order to be socially, you know, compliant. And then we bring that into the workplace as, you know, conflict avoidant or people pleasing or, um, uh, you know, unable to set boundaries, right? And one of the things that starts coming online is we discover this awakened sense, this awakened self. For all of us at some point, we start feeling our power again because we've been systematically disempowered in order to fit our family, school, the community, work. And one of the features of coming online as a spiritual awakening is finding our power. Which means we're going to have to renegotiate relationships and boundaries and what was once expected as a gentle rollover or kind or non, not, non, non, non conflicted, conflicting personality. Suddenly we have more of that edginess, right? And I'm not saying edginess is the way it's going to be forever, but there's, there's for many of us an adjustment period, right? And then we come back eventually to kindness, the genuine kindness that is the flowering, the blossoming of compassion, the compassion and the kindness that arises when our heart touches into the universal interconnected web of being. That's a very different form of kindness and compassion than the sort of be nice because it's the right thing to do socially. Yeah, this resonates uh, big for me. I've really been, uh, gone deep with toxic positivity in the past year and all of that. And that's what's, what's coming up for me when you say that. We'll get back to the career transitions, but while we're in this rabbit hole, hearing you talk about that reminds me of a video I saw from one of your videos where you were talking about an executive that you were working with. And when she basically said that her team couldn't come up with ideas. And I thought that was a very profound story, how you got to the root of her psyche and how she was leading. Could you tell that story for the listeners? Yeah, I could have. What that? I could if I remember the story. It's a video. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll jog your memory because I literally just watched it uh, yesterday. It was probably, yeah, probably like shot in the, the video a few years ago. Yeah. 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 No, all good. Totally. It, this was amazing because you were talking about how you met with this executive and she was saying how, like, when she has these meetings with her company, or maybe it wasn't her company, but she's an executive of a corporation and people didn't have ideas. And then as you unpacked it with her in your one-on-one -on -one coaching, I presume, uh, what, you, what you came to was that she was the oldest of three of three daughters and that she was always right. So she couldn't let other people be right. This jog your memory. 
yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on, I don't know if I use the Russian name of the video. Whoops. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, that's, it, it's still relating to this question you're asking about the career change, right? Because mm -hmm. here's this woman, and it, essentially the way that she got love, the way that she got recognition, the way that she got sort of affirmation, the way that she felt belonging, right, in her family of origin, is to be the superstar, the dominant one, right? There was one sister who was the kind one, one sister who was the, uh, I forget what, what the other two were exactly, but, you know, Sarah was like the rock and roller, right? And so essentially it's a combination of her natural gifts, right? Because she, you know, we have, we have, we have a, some form of karma when we come into this lifetime. I mean, I don't really care if karma is the real thing or not the real thing, but I'll tell you that I have two daughters and each of them at birth had a pattern, had a little personality. Each of them was even a different pregnancy, right? For my wife. And so the debate about nature and nurture, right? Like, are we a blank slate or do we, you know, or do we come in with something? It's both. There's, I don't understand the debate. But needless to say, we use whatever God given, whatever nature given, whatever karmic, you know, energies and capacities we have, and then we build on it. And so Sarah was already intense and smart and driven, and it was really fed in her family of origin. And then she becomes an executive, right? Which is partly how she got there is by being the smartest, the brightest, the fastest, the best executor, and the most creative, the most innovative. And now she's sitting in the room and she is way too bright, <laughs> way too illuminated, way too loud. And the rest of the room has to shrink back under the sheer sort of intense luminosity of her nuclear presence. And she's wondering, wow, why well the hell said. am I... <laughs> She's wondering, why am I feeling all alone in this room? Because she is all alone in this room. In effect, she has, she has in her inability to, do, to contract and hold space appropriately, she has caused everyone to evacuate the space. And uh, the beautiful thing is, and to her credit, as a smart, truly sort of curious human being, just knowing that began a path for her to do something different, you know, and we didn't have to repair family or initiative. We didn't have to do deep trauma work. She didn't have to do four ceremonies with Pachamama. You know, she could just, there's ways to go about it, but she had to, you know, she didn't have to change her career, but she still had to change herself, you know, and actually now that you say that interestingly enough, she did change careers after a while. <laughs> <laughs> There's the integration. As, as she became more aware of her, of her sort of, you know, origin story and how that doesn't have to define her anymore. And she began in her own rights and deeper spiritual practices. To your point, interestingly, she ended up changing careers. Mm. Wow. Do you remember her, what field she went into after that? Yeah. She actually went into being a, um, uh, an executive administrator in a county government. She and went and did. Yeah, in actually Northern California, not too far from you. She went and 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 uh, headed up um, uh, child and family services for a large county in Northern California. So she went from you know this you know corporate machine that is going to just gobble up people and produce results to somebody who's awake and go, I can use my powers to serve the community in a very different way. You know, but it, it was it was a journey for her. And, and I can think of one friend specifically, but I mean, this friend represents an archetype, including this person that you're talking about and many other people I know of, or maybe one of you listening that have these skill sets in corporate as an executive. And it's like, okay, maybe I don't want to be in this industry anymore, but how can I apply this to my skill set? To something else that is in more alignment. And that's a, a great example of like really, truly being aligned and being of service at doing uh, child services for the county, I believe you said. Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, part of the work that we did and part of the work that's, you know, central to what I do in, in this realm of conscious leadership, right? Conscious leadership is like, well, what the hell does that even mean? So um, I'll say that I've identified some of the core 
what I've come to call the number one barrier to executive effectiveness. I've come to call that this is what I've sort of come to recognize it, and I've named it ego myopia. Ego myopia, not being able to see and manage your ego, right? Yeah. And uh, it's sort of the beginning of the end of the story, right? Because that's where the work is, right? We can, we, we, we have to correct that ego myopia. And when we correct the ego myopia, which a lot of the spiritual practices, a lot of, you know, plant medicine, a lot of this awakening, these are all components of correcting this ego myopia, right? Becoming self-aware, that's getting to know the ego and becoming, you know, self-discipline, that's getting to manage the ego, right? So when I say ego myopia is not being aware and not managing the ego, Self-awareness, self-discipline, those are the, the ways we go about in, in addition to other healing modalities, right? Um, but that's not enough. The other part is that we have to cultivate the sort of three fundamental aspects of being a human being. And I refer to them as wisdom, love, and power. Hmm. Wisdom, love, and power. And for Sarah, who had, was leading with wisdom, with the head, with intelligence, capacity, with insight, perspective, right? She really did know um, and had a lot of power, a lot of juice around the capacity to make change, to drive purpose, but was fairly disconnected from her love, from that sense of bonding and binding, connection, you know, kindness to your point, compassion. That was offline for her because it was sort of beat out of her as a competitive person. And when we were able to integrate, right, bring online, she had a lot of wisdom, a lot of power, very little, you know, vibrational love. When we were able to integrate wisdom, love, and power, you know, the ego sort of, sort of, you know, comes down to size. It doesn't go away, but it starts, you know, feeling more corrected. She could look around and say, well, how else do I want to show up in this world? And uh, my wife used to laughingly say that anybody who signs up for, uh, for coaching with me has a one in four chance of quitting their job. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And I'd say to her, please don't say that publicly. <laughs> that's, a, that's really a shitty marketing line. <laughs> but uh, I'd say, you know, 20, 25% of the people that I, that I work with will, once they get more integrated, find that they're not working in a way that expresses who they are and who they're becoming. It's so funny you say that because when I wrote my book, Soul Life Balance, two years ago, and uh, I think I saw your book, shout out to your book, Leadership Breakdown, it was released in February 2023. My book, Soul Life Balance, came out in February 2022. But when I wrote that and was like, all right, what's next? Oh, speaking. Okay, great. And I started to look at the content from my book and uh, the first like quarter, maybe third of the book is all about like unprogramming and unconditioning that uh, I forget the word to use, but like disentanglement that you were talking about earlier of the awakening process. And I, I had a few different coaches or people I was working with and mentors and they're like, well, what do you ultimately want people to do? And I was very like green and new on this and everything, but I forget exactly what I said, but it was something to the effect of, well, I want people to realize that what they're doing is probably not in alignment and that they should should go somewhere else. So you want people to quit your, their jobs? I was like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and I was like, good luck getting, uh, getting hired gigs from a corporate company if that's going to be your message. And I was like, yeah, good point. Uh, which ended up being like this Trojan horse strategy of kind of like adopting my message to make it more accessible for professionals where it's just like planting these seeds and it's being like, wherever you go from here, is up for you to navigate. I have tools and resources. There's other tools and resources out there for you. But to your point as well, Eric, not for everyone is it going to mean that you're going to quit your job. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's going to mean that you're showing up as a leader to be more effective. So I'd love to get into that side of the conversation of how you're working with people in your coaching to have them be more aligned and effective in the workplace. Um, that, that's that's a really important and salient point, right? <laughs> because it isn't the job that we want people to quit. It's the pattern that we want them to quit. And we want them. I want my own pattern to quit. You want your own pattern to quit, right? So so this is all inclusive, right? We're not, uh, I'm not speaking of somebody who's done with the process. Um, yeah, agreed. But the point is a really important point, right? It is not the job. It's the pattern. So... 
uh, you know, John is a, you know, an executive in Silicon Valley. I'm unhappy with my work. My boss doesn't really give me the recognition. I mean, he's basically, you know, reporting to the CEO. So there's not a whole lot of, um, you know, it's the CEO is not, you know, my peers aren't this, my team isn't that. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I get it. Life sucks sometimes, you know. I can't come right out and say, well, what's your part in all this? Like in the first conversation, because that'd sound like an asshole, you know? I mean, when somebody's feeling really beset with the unfairness of the world, we have to navigate around to the point where you can finally land and say, wait a second, I'm a co-creator of my reality, right? And especially when you have a C title in a, in a large Silicon Valley machine, you have some latitude. That's why you're in that role and you're in that role because you have latitude. And so for John, you know, I think we're seven or eight months into the conversation, his urge to quit is largely dissipated because we've been able to come around to how do you quit the patterns that are dissatisfying to you? What are some of the patterns for him? Some of the patterns for him was, I don't get a chance to be creative. You're the freaking head of marketing, brother. <laughs> what do you think you don't have a chance to be creative? It means that he has, as an example, in John's case, he's lost touch with his power. Power is our innate, I'm talking about innate power. I'm not talking about power and authority, you know, guns, money. I'm talking about our innate power, that juice, that genius, that brilliance, that electric life force that bubbles through every cell in the body and radiates through us as an expression of you know, the Godhead in this form of who we are at this lifetime. That's power. That's the real power. And thwarting that power is the greatest sort of sin, right? To not radiate and shine through on the divine force that is the unique expression of who we are in this lifetime. To me, that's a sin, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to get too religious. I mean, that's the end of my religious association, right? But for John to say, I'm not, I don't have a chance to be created is John's trip. It's not the CEO's trip. It's not the team's trip. It's his trip. And he has run to a place of what I call a dry spell, right? So how do we get over that dry spell? How do we get back to the juice? That's the work, right? And when he was able to then start shifting, okay, I'm not going to believe this. I'm going to try this. Make little experiment to return back to that bell and creativity. Pretty soon, the job looks interesting again, right? The team was waking up again. The CEO is starting to make comments about, wow, you know, more more appreciation. But it wasn't that he had to go somewhere else as much as he had to land in, in the reality of who he is and where he is and what he's doing, recognize the pattern that he's perpetuating. And then, and this is where the coaching work is, right? Using wisdom to sort of see below the surface and beyond the obvious to really deconstruct the situation. Using love in this case for himself to compassionately hold space for himself and not let the inner critic beat the crap out of him. And then come into his power in such a way that he can re-express his creativity. He's loving his job right now. That's amazing. And if for someone like him or any of your clients, are are the people coming to you or is it like the company? Is the company uh, backing this or are they finding you somehow and being like, oh, I want to work with you and then paying out pocket is basically my question. Uh, 90% of my folks are um, corporate spend. So... You know, it's either because my, my clients are either the CEO, C suite folks in some larger organizations, you know, some of the big, it'll be VPs or, you know, so I'm working with the, with the senior level of the organization and 90% um, of them are company paid, right? So, um, but, but they still might be seeking me out, the company will pay for it, right? Um, there's, you know, a handful, three, four people that are paying privately on their own. Yeah, yeah. The reason why I asked that question is because that shows that the company is backing it, right? That the company is like, hey, there is some level of authenticity and vulnerability in this example of John, the executive and the CEO of being like, hey, something's off. I need some support, right? You know? Yeah. Um, so the company is backing them because they have the people that I work with are high value people. They're smart, competent, mature, senior level executives that are high value, right? And you know, the beautiful thing about, in particular, the coaching work is that 
in my coaching work is it, it's, I'm not doing charm stool, right? So I'm not the coach. It's like, oh, you're being an asshole. Let's help you be a nicer person. That's not really my gig. My gig is really, you know, for lack of a better word, initiatory, mm. right? I'm engaging with people who are standing at the precipice of an initiation. They are, they have walked to the flap of the tent with the initiation that's going to take place in ancient Egypt, but they haven't quite adjusted their eyes to the, to the dim light, nor do they know what to do in the ceremony. That's mm. what the coaching is about. Very cool. So, so that kind of, uh, I don't even know what I'm going to say here, but basically these people, it sounds like they, they're very much at that brink. Like for me, it was ayahuasca, right? And I, I can't look back and be like, I don't know that just like coaching would have done it for me. Like I, or for you, how you were like, oh, it wouldn't have worked to do ayahuasca in a weekend. I had to sell everything and go live by myself <laughs> for a year. Right. You know, and I'm saying, oh, for me, like, I don't know if coaching would have worked. So there's different levels. Right. So how do you get someone who's like, or I guess what I'm asking here is, are these people open to mindfulness and spirituality already? Like, where are they actually at? That's a, that's a really, um, that's really sort of a clarifying great question, um, I think. I'd say that 25% are already on a spiritual path and they want to do something more. That's just 75% or not. Um, and I'm not there to proselytize. You know, I'm not there to sell anything. I don't have a religious dogma to send on them. I don't need anybody to take plant medicine or even meditate, although I, they're all welcome to my meditation retreat. <laughs> and many of them eventually come. Um, I think for me, the sort of the far side of spiritual practice is just simple humanity, you know, and I've been traveling this path for almost 40 years now, right? So the far end of the spiritual practice to me, or the sort of the far side of it is, is increasingly just more simple humanity. And so for me, it's meeting these humans at this human place where they are unhappy, stuck, frustrated and yet full of potential and ambition. And so the coaching for me begins with a deep honoring of this humanity, right? And whatever name you want to call it, we will drop deep into what it means for them to be stuck, to be frustrated, to be human, and find the patterns that they are clinging to, that they're outdated, that they're willing to begin to pull on and untangle in order to allow the new, because usually when someone is stuck and frustrated, especially successful, what we'll called successful, right? High functioning professionals, there's an emerging sense of self. There's something else coming online that is bumping up against the prevailing dominant pattern, mm -hmm. right? There is a new level of creativity. There's a new, you know, version of, I want to manage people differently. I want to lead differently. I want to be able to um, express more of my particular vision that I haven't expressed as much before. I want a bigger scope because I feel like I can reach more people if I do more work, right? It's not all just ambition. There are these human dimensions that are coming online. And the coaching work for me, the beauty though, what I love about the 25 years, right, is that I get to engage with folks and name the emergent. That's my bigger concern than naming the problem. I spend very little time naming the problem. I won't get to the problem for probably a month worth of coaching. I'm going to sit with them. We're going to name the emergent. What we call in ceremony, setting an intention. Mm. Right? right? Because there is an intention bubbling through these humans and they haven't named it. So for me to name the emergent or to name the intention is the beginning of the coaching ceremony, the coaching journey. Yeah. Right. And once we name the ceremony, once we name the intention, we can be then begin to feel into and to talk about and to practice the places where it's working, the places where it's not working. But now we have, we have an orientation, right? We have an invitation. We have a, we have a felt sense pressure that we can actually tune into as a form of intelligence. As I say this, I realize this could sound incredibly esoteric, but in my world, it's remarkably practical. So I don't know if I'm bridging the gap here between. Esoteric and practical, but uh, that's the way I roll. 
I mean, I can't answer that because you're speaking my language and <laughs> you know, I try to tone it down. And I think in a lot of ways we both play, I like to say on both sides of the fence, you know, because I do like the really deep work and then the more accessible language. So it's, sometimes it can be challenging to be like, uh, okay, which form of language and I'm, am I using? I just got feedback forms from a, a keynote I did uh, virtually a few days ago. The first time I did my new presentation for my new book. And almost all of it was tens and like just amazing, amazing like feedback and comments. And one person said something about, uh, I don't remember how they phrased it, but like the language basically wasn't accessible and he needs to tone it down. And I was like, damn, like this is my toned down version. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Yes. There's uh, a lot still that I want to unpack and I have more questions. Um, I was just thinking of one of uh, them when these people that you're working with, let's go this way because I lost that one. How far is too far when you're working with your clients? Because I understand that you're a speaker as well and being that we're in similar industries or I'm getting into what you've been doing for so long. Like I think of it as like, okay, try and make it more accessible on stage. But then if I'm working with a group, a small group or one-on-one, -on -one, I can go deeper. How far can you go in terms of integrating spirituality into business and workplace culture when you're on stage though? You do a keynote uh, on stage or for you? For you. Yeah. It, doing a keynote. Yeah. Uh, my conclusion is similar to yours, right? Which is, um, you know, the number one rule of speaking is know your audience, right? And so know your audience. I got a great piece of advice, you know, early on when I was really sort of grappling with, I was like, I got all these great ideas, I'm putting it out there and it's not really landing. What's wrong with these people? <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a really cool mentor. And he said, um, Eric, you're trying too hard to sell your ideas and make it acceptable. Your job is to make it accessible, right? To your point, right? And so know your audience, right? And so I'm going to come in a click and a half about above the audience. I'm not going to come in exactly where they are. I'm not going to come below and I'm not going to go too high above, right? So I'm going to make this accessible and still a little with a little edge, right? So here's, here's where we are and here's the invitation. Right. That's, that's, that's how I do it on stage at work. In the group work, I basically have to put on and say, look, we have three possible ways that we can play today, today, now, whatever. Right. There's a safe space and the safe space is sort of fundamental, important, valuable to everyone. That means that nobody's hurt and nobody hurts one another. And if that's where we can, if that's what we need to be, that's where we need to be. If we can go a little further, then beyond the safe space, there's the brave space in the brave space where Exploring the edges, we're bringing up conversations that are, you know, more difficult. We're having, you know, we're, we're bringing up the energy that's stagnant into a place where it can roll and knowing that it's going to be bumpy and a little challenging, but I will take it upon myself to be the adjudicator and make sure nobody's hurt. But if you're willing to go to the brave space, we'll do that. And if you feel called, we can go to the sacred space. The sacred space is the place of the emergent, is the space of the unknown, is where uncertainty is a primary sort of invitation. And things emerge that we didn't expect, both dynamics and conclusions. So we can go safe, we can go brave, or we can go sacred, right? Or we can jump back and forth. And so I, I invite that into the conversation as a way to say, let's, you know, we all agree on this together. I'm not going to decide for you, but I want to let you know we can go to any one of those three. And if it's too far, we can back down. If it's too low, we can rise up. I love that. And what that's bringing up for me with the sacred and the brave is breathwork journeys. Cause I'm starting to see like breathwork journeys being offered at corporate events, conferences, and even places I I'm shocked to see it. I did a, a speech at Sherm conference last year, uh, HR professionals, for those of you listening, and it's, it's a conference for HR professionals. I mean, everyone there is like suit and tie pretty much, you know, it's, it's still right. And they're offering a breathwork journey, which is a deep dive into the psyche as a trauma release. And I'm just like, wait, what? What? Like, seriously? And I had the pleasure of facilitating a breathwork journey for about 100 salespeople uh, about a year ago. I was invited to do that from someone else's gig. 
And now she said every quarter they book her to come in to facilitate a breath, breath work journey at like their sales conference. And we're starting to see that more and more. But yet with breath work specifically, I know like your main thing is meditation, but I'm switching to breath work here for a second. This topic or this phrase, like it's not new, obviously. And some people are like, oh, it's it's not new because it's been around for 30, 40 years. Like you, you think it's new, whatever. I'm like, no, it's been around for thousands of years. <laughs> thousands of years. That's right. <laughs> but yeah, cool, cool. You know, like I, I've totally had people try and one up me on that. Like, and I'm like, wait, what? But anyway, so that's neither here nor there. Breath work is such a big term and it means so many different things to different people. I try to use the terminology of breath work exercises for those simple exercises that can shift us into rest and digest and breath work journeys for that trauma release. I feel like the language I've been using when I talk to corporate about breathwork journeys, I go back to the way I've facilitated breathwork journeys and it's more about trauma release. But I think corporate w might be more keen on bringing someone in to do breathwork journeys if it's not about trauma release, right? But if it's more about like unlocking creativity, because that's another form of it. And I'm curious, just throwing this all out there. There's not a question. It's just like a conversation. What comes up for you? Um, for one, I think, you know, trauma and trauma healing and in, in the current zeitgeist of sort of um, the seeker society and the general sort of general human society, the trauma I think that trauma healing has become, in effect, our new religion. Yeah. And I'll tell you that, you know, the great trauma healers are the new gurus, right? Yeah. Was a, you know, what's his name? Hubel, the German fellow. And, um, you know, the psychologists and therapists who are doing the trauma release are now gurus. They're literally spiritual gurus. Gabor right? Mate? Well, no, he's yeah, Gabor Mate, um, Hubel. I forget his first name. I apologize. German fellow, uh, wonderful teacher. But... Um, they've become essentially the gurus in this religion, right? And appropriately so, because we are profoundly traumatized, um, all the way from exiting the birth canal, you know, through True. the rest of the journey of life, right? Um, it's also really personal and a little bit, um, unpredictable into where the energy is going to go and what's going to happen, right? So if you take, uh, you know, a group of people, layman and ruling, trauma work without the support, without the context, without the expectations, without the follow-up, without the integration, you know, there's some potentially tricky territory you're stepping into. Um, but that birth work, I think, what does corporate want? What does what is, what is corporate want? It only wants one thing, right? Make me more money. Got it. But what do people in corporate want, right? They want to be more alive. They want to be more functional. They want to be more effective. They want to be more empowered. And so I think if you came at this more right, creativity and empowerment will be the two big sort of uh, levers that any corporate HR person or, or, or executive would really pay attention to, right? Creative, meaning I'm going to get more innovation and more initiative. That's awesome. Empowered, meaning I'm going to have more decision making on the ground level. At least God, yes. And I think that one of the reasons that we do the trauma work is because trauma work traps our power. Back to my conversation about wisdom, love, and power. It is, in fact, the trauma that has us struggle back our power or overuse it violently, right? And love too, right? And love. Love is held back in trauma and wisdom. Right? We were going to play small and not shine. And so, you know, to come and say breath work for, you know, uh, for sort of greasing the skids to creativity and unlocking empowerment, it's legitimate. And I think it's appropriate for the space and audience. I love wisdom, love, uh, love and power. And when you were describing it earlier, I was thinking about Kundalini. I've gotten into Kundalini quite a bit. And I think of it as like the power residing at uh, the low end, like the root. And then as you come up, you come to the love. And then as you activate and you come up, you get to the wisdom. You know, I kind of. That's exactly right. That way. That's how I think about it as well. I mean, wisdom, it, I talk about in my book, I talk about, you know, wisdom is sort of the head energy love is the heart energy and power is the gut energy right and even you know by uh, sort of a biologically we have these three brains and i'm sure you've seen the research right there's actual 
neural cells that form gang ganglia that can store information and, and process information. We have a head brain, we have a heart brain, we have a gut brain, actual neural cells, brain cells. This is not a metaphor, it's an actual physiological reality. And the super cool thing about you talk about Kundalini, the longest nerve in the human body, it's called the vagus nerve, and you probably do all kinds of polyvagal work and, you know, the vagus nerve sort of awakening. The vagal, the vagus nerve grows from the brain down to, to all the sort of the eyes and nose, down the, the neck into the heart and then all the way down to the gut. So we have a single and vagus, the word vagrant or vague comes from vagus in Latin, which means to wander. So the vagus nerve sort of wanders all the way down, connect to the head, to the heart, to the gut. But here's the thing that I find so freaking cool about what research and science has come up with. There's a flow of information, data that flows up and down this nerve, right? Electrical impulses that are data from the head to the heart to the gut. 70% of the flow of information, 70% of the information that flows in the vagus nerve goes up from the gut to the heart to the head. Mm. And we're so conditioned to thinking that the head runs the show, but on an actual impulse, energetic information flow of our human body, we are informed from the Kundalini seat, from the gut, up to the heart and to the head. And so when we can align head, heart, and gut, wisdom, love, and power, along this vagus nerve, along the spine, all of what you will, we now are coming online as conscious beings. And if we are conscious beings in a leadership role, well, holy shit, we're conscious leaders. Yeah. And see, this is like what lights me up, like this <laughs> sort of language. Uh, are, when I was asking earlier about like how far is taking it too far, like clearly this sort of language wouldn't be good on stage. But when you're working with like your one-on-one -on -one clients or your group meditation retreats or something like that, are you using more of this sort uh, of language, would you say? Well, actually, I use this language on stage. Oh, like, really? Oh, hundred percent. I have this slides with all of you showing the three brains. I have the base. I mean, I, no, I oh. straight up because to your point, it's accessible. Who's going to argue with the gut? Who's going to argue with science? That part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I meant the Kundalini side because we were talking about a few. Oh, the Kundalini things. side. Yeah, the Kundalini, because for sure, the you know, one thing I just Googled real quick because I was just, uh, I just saw this new Netflix documentary, which is incredible. It's called Watch, or oh, no, sorry, that's what it says. It's called Hack Your Health, The Secrets of Your Gut. And, you know, to just take the last few minutes here to go a little bit deeper, I've noticed in the collective conditioning, call it Hollywood movies, like everything, everywhere, all at once, win, winning an Oscar or whatever, the programming has shifted so much that is more in alignment with like personal sovereignty in these past few years. Is it, do you think that's more because I've awakened and I'm seeing that or I'm creating my reality? So I have more of that that's being created. Or in your 40 years or so, would you say it just in like past five, six years, give or take, maybe three years, even Pope's lockdowns, there's a lot more in the programming that has to do with like awakening? Um, I, I think. Yes, there is. I mean, objectively, there is, right? You can look at the path of the media, TV, books, podcasts, movies, right? There is a, there is an increased uh, focus on sovereignty and agency. Uh, wow. My contention, though, is that there isn't a commensurate training in how to actually take on this mantle of responsibility and wear the cape of your own power with dignity, with grace, with ease, and with integration. And so it's basically showing up more like chaos and, right. um, you know, nihilism than it is like spiritual awakening. Mm. And so the work that I do and the work that you do and the work that we're encouraging others to do is to integrate this shit, right? Because just to unleash it doesn't make it work, right? To unleash it is the first part. The second part is to integrate the third part is to embody it and the fourth part is to forget about it oh wow uh can you tell us a little bit more about why to forget about it because once you don't have to think about it anymore you, it's just you it's who you are you're not making the effort you're not practicing you're not trying to get there you are now an integrated embodied you know sovereign being in your life just forget about all the rest of the shit just live your life and, and zen they talk about 
you know, after enlightenment, the laundry. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's forget about it. You're enlightened. Now go do your laundry. Chop wood, carry water. Yeah. It is. It's the sort of, it's like I said, the, the far end of spirituality is a simple humanity. It, it's so true because like the days where I have beautiful synchronicities or whatever, I, I revel in that. And I'm like, this is so great, but you're right. Like that's kind of where I feel personally where I'm at is like the forget about it. It's like, oh yeah, of course. Cool. Now I'm moving on to the next thing, you know, and appreciate gratitude, all of that. Well, Eric, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate your time and dropping in with me. I love the work that you're up to. For everyone listening, if this is resonating with you, and I'm sure it is, check out Eric's book, Leadership Breakdown. You can find a link in the show notes with this podcast, along with his website is LinkedIn if you want to connect with him. Eric, do you have any final words for the listeners? My final words would be... Um... Those who are putting forth the effort for this evolutionary uh, awakening is to maintain somewhere in your consciousness close at hand that the work becomes easier and more sustainable when we can go deeper into self acceptance. Mm. All this element, because so often we get so hard at work to be better, to change, to grow, to improve. And a lot of that implies a certain built-in rejection and non-acceptance of who we are. And that's just going to make it longer and harder to do. So the invitation is do all this hard work, kick ass, do what you need to do, but keep self-acceptance close at hand. Thank you for saying that so much because you mentioned the name Soul Seeker a few times. I launched this podcast in 2019 and in 2021, actually it might have been late 2020, it doesn't matter, but I was like, Really, this podcast should be called Soul Acceptor or Soul Acceptance. And I'm like, eh, it doesn't sound good. But you guys will, you guys will hear, or maybe you've noticed for you longtime listeners since we're going on, I don't know, five years now of this podcast almost come this fall. In just the past few months, in the intro, I have a new intro where I talk about that. And I, you obviously didn't hear the intro, but it's not about the seeking. And it's the seeking that gets us to the stage of acceptance. So thank you for bringing that in. I love that. Sam, you're, you're, uh, you're a shining star. I thoroughly enjoyed this time with you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Eric. Talk to you later. Thanks, everyone.